Where was the chicken who laid the egg raised? And could I see it? Could I meet the chicken? Greetings. This is The Filter with Matt Asher. Sean Reif is an associate professor of psychology at Murray State University, where his research focuses on the intersection of technology and society, as well as meta-science and scientific reform. He is a co-founder and director of research at Site.ai, that's spelled S-C-I-T-E dot A-I, which uses machine learning to analyze citations in scientific journal articles. Sean, welcome to The Filter. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Our Initial topic of conversation is the idea of the total institution. Could you start us off by talking about the history and meaning of that idea? Yeah, so um, a total institution is a term that was popularized by the sociologist Irving Goffman. Goffman was a social psychology theorist from the sociology end of the intellectual spectrum that was really just sort of trying to understand human interactions on a, sort of a micro level. He used this term to describe institutions such as prisons or mental institutions and really sort of fleshes out the idea pretty fully in his book, a series of essays called Asylums, that's on the social situation of mental patients and other inmates. And the primary characteristic of total institutions is that they are uh, places where every aspect of a person's life is is really taken care of and overseen by some wider entity. So this would include things like nursing homes, certain hospitals, obviously prisons, or on the extreme end of the spectrum, you have things like concentration camps or work camps. And then sort of on the opposite end, you have things like uh, religious orders, monasteries, the common theme there is that every aspect of their existence is more or less taken care of by the institution itself. When I think about the term, I, there are definitely some institutions that are full total institutions. But more than that, I think the expression is meaningful in that you can put things on a spectrum. And you can look at a particular thing and say, to what extent is this like a total institution? And to what extent is it not? I have a certain mental list that I have of things that put it in the direction of being a total institution, like, are your movements completely controlled? Are you free to leave at any time? I think actually that the duration at which you are a part of that institution is also a factor as well. I wonder if you have any other thoughts on the particular list of items that move something in the direction of a total institution or away from being uh, considered a total institution. From my reading of Goffman, he wanted to, the term to be used in sort of a broader sense. So I think that people have argued, for example, can't remember where this comes from, but there is the idea that something like a, uh, a cruise ship might be considered an example of a total institution. And there are certainly properties of that. You have maybe designated mealtimes or designated places where you go for certain activities. You might have a schedule made out for you. But a defining feature of that type of experience is that it's voluntary, right? So you sign up for it. It's not something that's imposed on you from the outside. And so in that sense, it has something in common, for example, with maybe joining the military, I mean, that it's voluntary if you're not being, you know, if, if, if it's not um, like selective service. But then, you know, sort of within that realm, you have, again, things like, you know, you think about a prison, which is certainly not voluntary, or a mental hospital, which is, you know, if you're being committed against your will, that's certainly not voluntary. So I think that sort of the freedom to leave is an important consideration, but it, it doesn't necessarily detract from the overall idea of the institution itself. Goffman was more, again, as far as I can read, he was more interested in sort of describing the internal properties of the institution itself. He was less concerned, although not unconcerned, but less concerned with the uh, ability to freely enter or leave, if that makes any sense. For sure. And I think one of the things to keep in mind when talking about the term is that I don't think by itself one can call total institutions either good or bad. There's certainly the argument that if you are put in a total institution without your choice, then that's a, a terrible thing. But 
The case for total institutions uh, is that they provide a large number of guardrails or that this set of rules is in some ways freeing. If you go on a retreat, you are voluntarily committing to live a very circumscribed life where everything is laid out for you, what time you're going to eat, what you're going to eat. You don't even have the right the right, so to speak, to to speak for a large part of the day. And yet that can be, or so I've heard, I haven't done one myself, a lovely moment in one's life and very helpful. So being in a total institution in and of itself, or at least for a period of time, doesn't necessarily indicate that something is good or bad by itself, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly there are plenty of examples that we can see where society as a whole is aided by the presence of total institutions. And we've already talked about the existence of prisons and mental hospitals. But you can even look at something like a nursing home or a hospice uh, care as being a type of total institution that also benefits the person who is residing within that institution. And I think that in the sort of the examples that you're giving, it's, it's really interesting because the examples that you're giving of something like a retreat or you know, you're sort of temporarily letting go of your responsibility to make certain decisions every day. And that has a kind of liberating factor to it. There's a certain pleasantness if you're someone who spent a lot of time making hard decisions every day. To have that burden removed, I think, is actually an advantage, at least for a small period of time. There's a story, and I don't know, uh, I assume this is true, that uh, Steve Jobs started uh, this process of basically just wearing jeans and a black turtleneck every day because the man made so many decisions on a daily basis. It was one less thing he had to deal with. It's sort of taking that idea and and, uh, taking it to its logical conclusion, at least for a, a period of time. And he was a big fan of that kind of retreat, too, so I have no doubt that that was in his head at the same time. I can completely see that, especially as our lives get more and more complicated. There is this pull that I feel, too, to try to take as many of the day-to-day things that I do and put them in the category of things that I don't have to think about. Now, it's different when you are, in a sense, making, you know, making, it's not a total institution, but you are creating structure for yourself. You're creating a set of rules that you are going to try to follow and that eliminate those, I guess, the pain points of decision making, especially over small trivial things like where you're going to eat breakfast or what you're going to wear and those kind of things. And I think that there's also a broader thing that happens in society where we have a a push and pull between times at which the way you live your life is very much open in terms of you choosing your own path. And then other societies at times, the entire society is very strict, let's just say, about how you live your life. And there may be a, a push and a pull wherein the more open a society gets in some ways, the more certain people crave a kind of order that would lead them to appreciate being in a total institution. For example, I know some people who joined the military who grew up in very chaotic homes, and they were very thankful for the military for providing that structure and for being in a place where, yes, it was a total institution and then there was a loss there of autonomy, but at the same time, there was the structure and organization and the chaos of their everyday life fell away. I also know people who have had that experience with joining the military and they say almost exactly what you said, that that structure was something that they needed. It was something that they didn't know how to do. It wasn't something that was imposed upon them by their parents, which is I think the way most people, you want that that sort of structure imposed in that scenario. And so, yeah, I mean, and then kind of getting into this sort of dichotomy, this push and pull between the individual and society. One point that you could potentially argue is that there are extremes in terms of the extent to which a given society is sort of imposing those rules or acting as an entire, as, as a total institution itself. Certainly, I think you could make a very good argument that a place like North Korea is in in and of itself, the country of North Korea is to a limited extent uh, a kind of total institution. Certainly, sort of authoritarian regimes do have a component of that. And 
you know, and then you, you get to a place like the United States, where it's very much the opposite sort of situation. At least until more recently, when <laughs> just your ability to leave your house is now under question or go do your job, which I think actually is a good bridge to perhaps the uh, the other side of a total institution, which is that they uh, limit what you can do as a human being. They limit the extent to which you are able to achieve your full potential especially if you're put into a total institution involuntarily. And duration matters too, right? You voluntarily give up some of your freedom to go be in a retreat for a week, but you know that you are getting it back at the end of the week when an entire society becomes a total institution or you're committed. Then it's not clear when you're going to get that liberty back to make basic decisions about your life. That exit option is actually rather important. I mean, we do kind of, I think, poo-poo the idea of uh, you don't like it, leave. But the ability to do so is actually rather central. Now, in terms of of sort of the degree to which I guess we, we are seeing over the past year more strictures on our behavior, more strictures either imposed by the state or imposed voluntarily on ourselves in terms of what we can do and uh, and how we can socialize. That's a very different sort of question. I guess I, I think about that outside of the realm of, of a total institution because there are still plenty of freedoms that I have that I can enjoy just in the privacy of my own home. So, I mean, that kind of brings me more to this, this question of, you know, to what extent do I want the state to have the power to force me to abide by certain rules to prevent the spread of a pandemic? And that to me is in very much a sort of different kind of question. You know, we all think of, I think, the, the primary thing that the state should do is monopolize the use of force. This is a very sort of uh, Mox Weber kind of point. But then, you know, we come to things like, well, do I want the government to be able to uh, impose rules upon me that will prevent the spread of a communicable disease? And that kind of is in the category of things that I, I would probably like the government to be able to do. So it's, it's a more narrowly tailored type of infringement on my rights. I don't necessarily like it, but I, I feel like that is at least within the sort of Overton window of what I'm willing to consider is a legitimate role for the state to play. Now, this is very different than, say, something like seatbelt laws. Those are not designed to protect anyone but myself. And on that regard, I find that kind of an imposition. So those, I guess those are just categorically, in my mind, sort of different things. I see it more as a, a continuum in the sense that everything we do can always be read as something that has a negative impact on others. Everything has negative externalities, to use an economics term, and everything has the potential to harm other people. And certainly when you live in a society where you are on the hook for the medical care of others through taxes or other things, then you are automatically in a position where the justification for imposing a rule always exists on the basis that this might provide some benefit to other people if we constrain you, because everybody is, in a sense, exposed to everybody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Viewing it that way, you could consider it on a continuum. I've noticed this in conversations in particular with my undergraduate students. There is a tendency sometimes to not distinguish between ultimate and proximate causation. If I fail to wear my seatbelt and I get into a horrible car accident that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars in treatment and medical care later on, does that have an effect on the aggregate cost of health care or health insurance down the line? Sure. Sure, it does. You can, you can definitely make that argument. If I, if I choose to eat Twinkies and not go to the gym and drink too much and just be generally irresponsible, is that going to have negative externalities? Absolutely. But the question is how many steps removed from me are those, do those negative externalities manifest? And I feel like you do at some point have to draw a line. You do at some point have to say, okay, this is so far afield from the person who was initially engaging in that behavior that the number of links in the causal chain is so many that we're not considering these things as directly related one to the other. So maybe that's not a argument for a different category of behavior or regulation, but it is to say that they are perhaps much farther from one another than one might think. I think that's a fair point, and it's also worth considering in all of these things that 
there's always the case to be made that what looks like a negative uh, might actually not be a negative. I think of the classic case of smoking where some people argue that if people die early, well, you're actually saving overall health costs because this person didn't spend their 80s in and out of the hospital racking up giant bills and using resources. And certainly the more steps removed you have between the end thing and the initial cause, the more opportunity there is for there to be uncertainties about which way something is going to ultimately break in terms of being a cost or a benefit. Uh, but I want to actually step back and think about the idea that of the justification for the total institution, which is related to what you were saying, which is that we are inherently at times threats to each other and to ourselves. And I would say that is the justification for every total institution I can think of, unless you can think of another justification that's put out there for the creation of these institutions. Well, so, I mean, it would depend on the institution. I mean, certainly the, the justification that you're outlining for, for things like prisons and mental institutions or mental hospitals, that is exactly as you described. That is the pretty straightforward justification. But there are, you know, for example, we talked about the military. That is, you know, the military exists to protect the interests of the nation, but it's a bit more complicated than sort of the institution like a prison where you're, you know, the person who is being institutionalized, probably against their will, is directly responsible for the harm that could come to society if they were living out in society. Uh, in terms of the military, which I think is is a perfectly reasonable example of, of a total institution, it's, it's more complicated than that, right? The threat is not from within, but from without. And so this, again, gets kind of back to that idea that the, uh, at least from my reading of Goffman, the thing that sort of unites these different institutions is the way they function internally less than the way, than sort of their, their purpose, I guess. And, you know, he was a, he was an ethnographer, a so, you know, sociology. He was doing sort of observational research at the time. So that was kind of what he was focused on. I think that the justification for total institutions can differ substantially from institution to institution. For sure. Maybe you could expand a bit on the idea of that internal kind of machinations in a total institution. The overall theme is that you have a group of people who are in similar circumstances and who are, to at least some extent, cut off or removed from the broader society. And they have a life that is, is sort of administered or dictated to them by some external authority. Um, other than them. So you have restrictions on freedom, you have restrictions on decision making, uh, you have a more narrowly tailored life. I guess the role of total institutions in society isn't an interesting question, to be honest with you. It's just not one that I had thought of. I had thought of just sort of individually each institution by itself. So I guess that's always the sort of been the component of it that I have focused on in my own mind. One of the things about the total institutions is that they are certainly useful to certain interests. Of course, the military is useful as a way of protecting the country, and also it has a purpose in terms of funneling money to certain interests within a society and protecting those interests as well. These total institutions are serving somebody. Sometimes they're serving the people who are in it. Sometimes they're serving broader interests. As you say, there are societies that look like they are total institutions of themselves, like North Korea. And I would say that society, does it serve dear leader? Maybe it does. Certainly that particular person and the people close to him are living relatively good lives in relation to the vast majority of the people there. And they have perhaps a lot more freedom than the people there, though relative to just a regular person in our country, it's not clear. But these things crop up throughout history because they're useful. I see something of a return of total institutions right now because there is that use for that in terms of control. And I wonder if you see a kind of creeping return of total institutions as a thing in our modern era. When you say recently, how recently, what would you qualify as recently? Like a number of years, past decade? 
or past year? I would say that perhaps in the last 20 years, since maybe since 9-11, we have a takeover of society to some extent by the deep state. I don't think there's any other word for it that we have or phrase for it. We have a federal bureaucracy that is very, very large and very extensive with a huge set of rules and that undertakes a wide swath of activities. And we have also a, a giant expansion in the number of rules that apply to everyday people. And that certainly in the time of COVID has expanded to a huge extent down to the governor's. But it also, you have a, a, a structure where people are perhaps being, this is going to sound conspiratorial, it's not meant to, but where people's lives are being circumscribed and controlled in ways that they're not even necessarily aware of. In other words, that there are institutions that are putting us inside what might be called a total institution, and maybe we haven't even fully noticed that yet, because mostly until you know, until the past few months with the lockdowns, we go about our business and we just have to pay our pound of flesh to the man and we don't think too much about it and we don't pay too much attention to the fact that every email we send is being databased and cataloged and all of these things are happening behind the scenes. Yeah, time frame, I'm on board. It's interesting. The thing that I would have really pointed to as an example of sort of greater social control or would have to do more with regulatory agencies and almost a sense of, I want to say, paternalism, state paternalism. And that is the thing that really sort of captures my imagination because it's a really... I can't, I can never remember the name of the woman. She wrote a book. It came out, I want to say in like 2010, it was called Against Autonomy. And it was exactly what it sounds like. It was basically the, this idea that people cannot be trusted to make decisions that are in their best interest. It was fascinating to me because it was a kind of nakedly authoritarian paternalism, which basically just presumed that nobody understood what was in their true best interest. I guess that is the kind of mentality that I would have really pointed to in terms of a creeping, total institutionalized American experience. And I guess I've noticed less of that over the past couple of years as more sort of cultural issues have really dug in and, and become at the forefront of, of our national discourse. Cancel culture things, it's almost like that notion of autonomy as being under threat has kind of fallen off the radar. I wouldn't have said that about life over the past two or three years, but I would have said that about life over the past 20 years. And certainly I should say in my own field of social psychology, the idea that people cannot be trusted to act in their own best interest is a kind of assumed thing where the field that gave you is sort of the precursor to behavioral economics. We're at fault for a lot of this stuff, too. I don't know if that's the direction you wanted to go with that, but that's what I had on my mind. So. I think that's very interesting. Behavioral economics is something that ends up coming up a fair amount on this podcast, actually. And I see a multi-pronged assault on the idea that human beings are of themselves capable of making decisions. And usually this is proffered by people who are doing it in, I think, is a fairly self-serving way. They're saying, essentially, human beings are not smart enough to take care of themselves or make rational decisions on their own behalf. So we're going to do it for you. And we're going to do it in a way that almost certainly increases our own power, financial or otherwise. And then that's always the government's excuse for certain regulations, especially when they have to do with just a, a private contract that doesn't necessarily have clear negative externalities to the public, something like what California did with the regulation of contractors with Uber is essentially they're saying, no, you're too dumb to figure out what a good gig is and what is a gig that's going to make you money. So we're going to come in and have a blanket law that says that if you do more than 10 gigs in a year, whatever that law was, that you're now an employee of that company. And of course, the, the negative results of that were so obvious that I don't understand how one couldn't have thought of them in advance. But the justification is that you guys are too dumb or too weak to be able to enter into this contract freely. You know, not surprisingly, the people who, who want to institute that kind of uh, paternalistic 
I, I do think of it as paternalistic regulation, are always very sure that they know how to do it better. When, when I think about all the different sort of writers and thinkers that I have a lot of respect for, I'm starting here with Hayek, I guess, and I could go off on an entire list, is their humility. It takes a lot of gumption to say that we know what is in the best interest of our constituents, more so than they do. And then to think that also, not in addition to that, you also know that there won't be the kind of negative externalities which will actually redound to the decrement of the people who, you know, who you live in your district or in your state or whatever. It takes an astonishing amount of, I don't know if it's self-confidence or just arrogance. I'm always amazed at the extent to which not just lawmakers, but I see this in, in everyone, seem to, to think that they could do it better. Anytime you get someone who thinks that they can do it better, I, I get really nervous. So that, you know, I think intellectual humility should be the order of the day. There's a bit of a crisis in, uh, in science and in, in social science and particularly social psychology. We're probably the worst and that a lot of our findings aren't replicating. That includes potentially some of the uh, the behavioral econ findings I just saw. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was one of uh, the kahneman Traversky findings um, that just popped up as not replicating. I can't remember which one it was. I haven't read the paper yet. Let's just say that the vast majority of the behavioral economics research is just crap. I, I don't know any other way to put it. Um, I know that as an academic, you uh, are not necessarily as free to just use language like that about an entire body of research, but... Oh, no, I'm tenured, so I can, <laughs> I can say that it's BS. It's fine. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that that's, that's probably... Uh, you're probably not wrong. Let me narrow the criticism, because there's some behavioral econ stuff that's like, well, you know, uh, if you make the default A instead of B, on the average, it, it's more likely going to be A, right? People are, you know, defaults get selected more often because they're defaults, right? But that's, that's not terribly, you don't have to do an experiment to convince me that that's the case, right? But some of the more intricate uh, findings, and, and I'll, I'll narrow my criticism here because it feels distasteful to criticize other people's fields, but social psychology as an entire discipline has not covered itself in glory. It's basically, I mean, I think what you said about hate behavioral econ, I would tweak that and just say that about social psychology. The majority of things that we thought we knew 20 years ago, we just don't. We're realizing now we don't. That should alarm people who think that a benevolent actor at the level of the state can institute policy that will have their desired outcome. I mean, this gets into the links in the causal chain and also, you know, how, how much causal density is there? How many different factors can intervene at any one of those links and completely disrupt the intended effect? I think that lawmakers are much, much, much too sort of sure of how direct an effect they can have. And to be honest with you, in my field, uh, including professional organizations in my field, have really done a lot of damage to that. They've contributed to that sense. I'll never forget, years ago, there was a, a lawsuit that made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court um, that was basically about video game violence. Now, the APA, the American Psychological Association, has a long-standing position on this, that violent media causes violence in the real world. They're absolutely 100%. They're convinced of this. Um, they have a very large meta-analysis of meta-analyses. So it's, it's a doubly meta. And they submitted this to the Supreme Court. And basically, I, I, if you read Scalia's opinion, I wish I had the name of it up, up in front of me, but if you read Scalia's opinion, I mean, he basically laughs them out of the room. This entire body of research is based on a series of completely bizarre experimental manipulations that don't actually track real violence. They track proxy measures of violence. And then, of course, the entire idea that media has this direct causal relationship with violence in the real world is really it's revealed to be complete nonsense just by the fact that over the past two, three decades, media has become increasingly violent, increasingly more realistic. Video games are more realistic and violent. And what has happened to the level of violence in places where video games are extremely popular? It's gone down, right? Now, if you were a sensible legislator, you know, you would look at that and say, that doesn't track logically. That doesn't make any sense. But I, th I think the APA in particular, I'm maybe getting a little too inside baseball here, but the American Psychological Association in particular has really taken it upon themselves to voice positions on policies when really they don't have the evidence to do so. They think they do, but they don't. Certainly, I think there's a lot of reason to 
be cautious and to take the Hayekian line that we should have humility in um, what we think we can design, especially when it comes to systems that are actually going to be lived in by human beings. Shifting a little bit, you've spoken a bit about Thomas Saz, and um, he was a strong arguer against mental illness as a thing, especially at a time when a large number of people were being put in total institutions because their thinking didn't comport with what we consider to be normal ways of thinking. And that's not to say that those people were not necessarily dangerous to themselves or others. I think in some cases they were, in some cases they weren't. But there was a, a backlash from Saz and perhaps others against the idea that we can both decide what is normal within the realm of a person's head and then also that we can come in and design institutions that can effectively make the situation better by institutionalizing those people. Is that a good kind of introduction to his thinking? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary. Yeah. So Saz is, I mean, I mean, he he pulled no punches. Routinely, his his sort of thing was that in his mind, the, the whole notion of mental illness was just patently absurd. You know, as a committed libertarian, he thought that it had a lot of potential for abuse. And, and certainly there are plenty of instances. I mean, the, you, you saw this in, in the Soviet Union and South America and various places where failure to conform to the correct political ideology was thought of as in and of itself indicative of an underlying mental illness or was just a mental illness, right? Yeah, and I think he hit the nail on the head in terms of its potential for abuse. It's certainly sort of, sort of the uh, the lighter version of that is, you know, at the height of institutionalization in America. One thing you notice if you go to a mental health care facility, uh, one of these large state mental institutions, you know, they're usually in some sort of small town backwater away from major city centers. And one argument that's often made, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, is that, you know, these places are not so much for the care of the people who are institutionalized there, but they're more about sort of removing people from society so that we don't have to reckon with the fact that they exist, right? I mean, there's a big debate in psychology as to whether or not deinstitutionalization that you saw happen in the latter part of the 20th century was a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. But I, I think that that end of, of Saz's critique was definitely correct. The, the other part of it, which is the question of how should we think about mental illness, there is a... a a thing that I, I think a lot of people in my field don't want to, and I should say, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but a lot of people who in clinical psychology and psychiatry, they don't want to say publicly what they kind of know, which is that um, we don't have the same kind of diagnostic tools for mental illness that we have for virtually every other kind of known uh, health problem. And Saz took that to the logical conclusion of, well, then it doesn't exist, right? I think that's where I kind of get off from, from the Saz train, I say, no, it may just be that we don't have the tools to accurately diagnose these conditions. We diagnose these conditions based on you know, structured clinical interviews, when really what we want to do is we want to be able to say, look, there's a certain pattern of neural connections, or there are 20 different patterns of neural connections, and that's what we call schizophrenia, and we can identify them and we can treat them directly, but we're just not there yet. So, you know, I, I think that that's the part where Saz got himself m into more trouble than he should have by saying that it's not real. I think that's a really important point. And in general, one of the things we see throughout the history of science and medicine in particular is that anything that we don't have a De definitive mechanism mapped out for gets kind of shunted off to the side and we pretend that it doesn't exist. And that's a, a broader problem. I actually wrote about this a, a long time ago on statisticsblog.com in an article, I'll link it from the show notes, about kind of dumb arguments from smart people. And one of them is that 
we haven't figured out the mechanism whereby this works, therefore it's not happening. That's a caricature of the argument, but I think that there's a lot there in saying that something like that, that mental illness doesn't exist because we don't have a way to look at an MRI and identify it, or we don't have a precise description of the chemical mechanism whereby mental illness comes about. That's that's not, and I'm in no position to weigh in on, you know, on the medical side of uh, mental illness or on whether in a broader sense it exists or doesn't, but certainly just saying we haven't figured out the mechanism for the causality, that's by no means a reason to discard something as a category of something that definitively exists. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And actually, that's an interesting point that there's a version of that point that I make to my grad students when I teach grad statistics, which is that um, you know, we have mediation analyses where you can say, well, X cause, you know, X is associated with Y and that's mediated through M. How much are you going to drill down and and sort of break apart that mediator? Because uh, everything that we do in psychology is, is you know, sort of these these constructs that we measure with multi-item questionnaires and stuff like that. How much are you going to break that apart? Because you can really just – it's sort of like turtles all the way down. You can just drill down and drill down and drill down. Um, and at a certain point, you just have to stop and say, you know what? The conceptual utility of continuing to list out – causal connections from one to another, eh, we're just done with it. It's just, it's no longer, it's no longer doing anything interesting for us. It's not informing my theory. It's not helping me to understand the thing that I'm really, you know, the relationship that I'm trying to get at. At some point you have to just stop. If that makes any sense. Yeah. And I, over time, I've actually become much more enamored with just straight up correlation as the way to go. I think that in some ways, when it comes to a variety of fields, including perhaps psychology and a lot of the social sciences and economics, that we've plucked the low-hanging fruit as far as understanding mechanisms. And now to make further advances, what we have to do is just rely on correlations and on consequences and treat as much as we can like a black box. This is how all of the gains have been made in AI and in advanced statistical methods, like the kind of things that Visa uses to try to figure out if a transaction is fraudulent. They don't have someone thinking up all of the things that would make a transaction fraudulent, they just have a ton of data and an algorithm that can be as complicated as it wants to be that spits out certain factors that point it more or less in the direction of being a fraudulent transaction. And I think that's how we move forward and how we move forward too in terms of thinking of what are the consequences of this. So I think you could make a first principles argument could go back to the idea of California and the law that restricted contracts in the gig economy. You could say from the beginning, this is what this is going to lead to. Or you could just go, every time you do this, this happens. Every time you have regulations, it has unintended consequences. And every time you limit a contract, it has these particular effects. And you could come up with all kinds of explanations about why it's not going to happen in this case. You see people do that with the minimum wage law all the time, that people pretend like a change is going to be so small that it's not going to have an effect, right? Right. But you just look at the broader correlations and you can go, it looks like the more you ramp this up, the worse things get in this way and the more you spin off side effects. And then that, to me anyway, gets you back to the idea from humility and thinking, we know that this is going to cause some nasty stuff, most likely. Maybe we should think harder about it. Maybe that was too vague. I'm not sure. No, I think that makes sense. The the thing that also occurs to me is that to an extent, it's not the obvious Take a policy like rent control. The consequences of, of rent control, the negative externalities associated with rent control are pretty obvious to me. And Thomas Sowell said that it was second to dropping a nuclear bomb on a city, the surest way to devalue property in any area. Those are obvious. What I think is is even more sort of concerning to me is, is the negative consequences that you don't immediately tie to the policy. There are negative consequences to everything, right? Uh, Life is a risk. Going out and living every day, there's risk. But I think that that should also make us a little bit more hesitant to intervene on the part of the state. You know, markets work really, really well 
our bias should always be towards not intervening in that sense rather than intervening, which is a really hard sell. You know, I mean, I have I have undergraduates who are, are paying God knows how much in rent and they hate rent and they love the idea of rent control, right? But for a very sort of face value reason. And yeah, I kind of have to talk them through, well, what happens if you do this? And that's a public relations problem there. I think there's also just a natural tendency among human beings whenever something goes wrong to try to correct that and not necessarily to live with that. I wonder if you could speculate a little bit about the role here of religion, because that makes me think of that, and the ways in which you have kind of a push and pull between secular total institutions like the military and branches of the government in terms of the extent to which they exercise control over a society, but like total control in North Korea, or almost total control, and religions that also can have a very strong set of rules for people. And certainly we see this in sects like the Amish, where you are living a life that has a lot of details or Hasids, in terms of there are a lot of things you have to do at very specific times and many, many, many rules you have to follow. And the extent to which in an increasingly secular society, I used to be not at all convinced by this argument, but over time I'm wondering more whether the conservative argument that the state and state institutions are in fact taking over for the religious institutions in terms of presenting us with total orders that we are shunted into one way or another. Religion is interesting, and, and the way I always think about this in relation to what you're saying is we want to know what the rules are so that we can abide by them and so that things will be all right. Uh, this is sort of, I, I think, the really the impetus for you know really strict literal readings of Christian scripture, right? What are the rules? Tell me the rules and I'll do it. And yeah, as society becomes more secular, you do, I think, have a sort of shifting and a sort of seeking of some alternate authority to tell us that. Maybe in some cases it's the state. I, th I think in a lot of other cases, I mean, it would de be dependent upon the issue you're talking about. But certainly I see that impulse and it's, it's almost a kind of impulse to purify oneself expressed I mean, in, on a lot of social issues, I don't know if you want to go down this rabbit hole, a lot of people have pointed out, and I think it's a valid point, that a lot of the sort of um, new, uh, newer social issues regarding race, regarding uh, trans issues, these have a lot of the hallmarks of religion in terms of what I'm allowed to say or not say, think or not think. So I almost think about it not so much as, as shifting a, a religion away from religion and to the state, but more of an issue of, of shifting away from religion and just to different secular sort of gurus who are sort of allowed to, to tell us what we are allowed to think and what we're allowed to say, if that makes sense. I would, I would go even further down that rabbit hole and say that a lot of modern cultures about the establishment of purity rituals that have to do with your own moral cleanliness and the talk nowadays is all about racism, but before that you had everything from we should be drinking bottled water, we should be doing enemas, we should be expressing our moral purity in a number of ways, or, you know, we're going to eat whole foods, even if there's not necessarily a lot of research behind it. One of the coolest expressions I heard not too long ago was that of a purity spiral, where you get a group of people who essentially outcompete one another in terms of how rigorous and, you know, and aggressive and zealous they are in their pursuit of a particular ideal, right? There was a motto of one particular organization in the 60s. It was no one to the left of us, right? Meaning we want to be as far to the left as anyone. And the problem with that, of course, is that you end up adopting really extreme views in an attempt to keep up with that, right? Same kind of thing. So I, I've, I've poo-pooed my discipline a lot, but I, I will back up on that and say there is a theory that I think does have some good evidence around it and does make a lot of sense, and that's Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations theory. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. It's changed a little bit, but there are between five to seven different basic psychological moral foundations that people access when they're determining whether or not something is, is right or wrong. And one of those foundations is, is purity. 
And so initially, when Haidt and his colleagues were starting to measure this one foundation of, of purity, the questions about it were very religious in nature. So they were questions like, you know, one of the main things that would determine, you know, whether or not I thought something was right or wrong was whether or not God approved of it or whether or not it was defiling to my body. And those are questions that really tap in to a sort of right wing, more conservative religious notion of what it means to be pure. What does it mean to be pure? It, you know, late 90s early 2000s, this was popular. Sexual purity was the main thing that was popular in these circles. And one thing that people pointed out was that, you know, these are questions that are really tailored to strictly right-wing purity. Because I noticed that people on the left didn't endorse those questions at all. But in the newer versions of, the, uh, of it, it's tweaked a bit. So it accesses components of left-wing purity that are exactly like what you're talking about. There's a scene in Portlandia where they're ordering breakfast and they're asking, well, where was the chicken who laid the egg raised? And could I see it? Could I meet the chicken? That's an extreme version of this, but it is a left-wing instantiation of that sort of basic moral impulse we have to remain pure, to remain undefiled by the world. There are some problems with the theory, but I think that that taps into that symmetry between the religious right and the secularly religious left. I think that's well said. Shifting slightly, but building on that, I see in this moment here of, of the virus and the fear of the virus, the use by the state of a different kind of purity, the idea that there's this virus, this threat all around us, and it's contagious, and it's going to infect us, and that we ourselves are going to be essentially defiled by it and then become carriers for this disease as extremely useful in terms of controlling people's behavior. You start with the premise that Every decision is a medical decision. The decision to leave your home is a medical decision. The decision to wear a mask or not, the decision of going shopping or ordering in or going to the theater, all these things are turned into medical decisions because all around you is this threat and this threat will harm you. And I don't think, especially given the levels of mortality that we actually see, I think that the only way to really understand this moment is as a kind of collective purity spiral driven by fear because the numbers and the reaction to it, and in particular the strategies, there's no evidence at all that they work in terms of the lockdowns except for perhaps, you know, temporarily shifting mortality and, you know, and causing a, a huge number of side effects. But what they do accomplish is creating feelings among those who are obeying those dictates that they are remaining pure and that they are avoiding these threats of contamination. And I think that most people have backed off somewhat from the initial fear that drove them to even wipe down groceries. I was talking with another guest about those kinds of reactions. But even as we've maybe backed away from more extreme ways to act to remain pure, we are still nonetheless supposed to be wearing masks and supposed to be avoiding this and that, despite the fact that it's not clear that the threat level relative to others in our life, even just regular things that can happen like car accidents, is all that great. Certainly, the underlying theme there is, is uncertainty. You know, uncertainty breeds fear. I feel like this is something you can sort of see almost in, in every generation. I mean, um, after September 11th, there was a lot of concern about subsequent terrorist attacks and things that never materialized. And, and in retrospect, we realize the concern over that kind of thing was really overblown. And certainly, you know, when the coronavirus hit the United States, we were still at a very early stage of understanding exactly how the virus was transmitted. And so, yeah, you have a sort of toxic combination there of fear and uncertainty, and then politicians who don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. What's interesting to me is the way that that has shaken out politically. So the traditional social psychological thinking about who should be more concerned about disease, particularly disease from without, disease from another country, disease from a different people. The orthodox social psychological take on this is that conservatives are going to be the ones who are going to overreact. They're going to be the ones who are going to be wiping down their groceries and wearing three different masks every time they go out to the grocery store, if they go out at all. And as it turns out, no, not even close. 
I know a bunch of different people who are really trying to sort of scratch their heads about that. But I think that the real reason why it's not materialized that way is that the evidence for that sort of conservative liberal divide over cleanliness and purity and disease from without was probably overstated to begin with. And partisanship probably means a whole lot more in terms of just who happens to be president and who's going to bear responsibility for the outcome. I just always say partisanship's a hell of a drug. I don't know if that's where you were going with that, but that's that's one thing that's on my mind a lot because, uh, I mean, I have, have said to students, you know, if you want to come up with a good research agenda, try to understand uh, or to at least recapitulate the social psychology of the American right and how it didn't behave at all as we would have thought it would under the conditions of a global pandemic. Yeah, I think there's a lot of richness there in terms of how things um, played out and whether you could imagine an alternative future or an alternative past with a few tweaks that would have led to a very different partisan divide. I mean, if I could just see what the world would look right now if Hillary Clinton were president during the pandemic, I just really wish I could see both of those universes at the same time, because that's the only thing that's going to answer that question for me. Um, so I'm not going to get an answer. Yeah, maybe maybe when we figure out the source code of the simulation we're in, we'd be able to run those uh, those experiments. Before wrapping up here, I want to talk just a bit about your project, Site.ai, because I find it fascinating and uh, probably very much something that we need. Why don't you let the listeners know a little bit about it? Site.ai is a Brooklyn-based startup that I founded with uh, three other people, Josh Nicholson, Yuri Lebesnik, and Milo Mordrant. What we're trying to do is quantify scientific citations. So, you know, I write a paper where I describe an experiment that I've done. I describe the previous studies that have come along before it. And then I talk about my results and whether or not my results were consistent or inconsistent with previous studies. The problem that you run into is that we have, I think, over 117 million different scientific publications out there in the wild right now. You know, understanding exactly what the literature is saying on any given scientific topic becomes increasingly difficult. So, you know, what our software does is we take scientific papers and we have software that we run them through and we analyze what different authors are saying about other papers. And generally speaking, whether or not the language is positively or negatively valenced. I'm saying my results are consistent with FISB et al. 2016, then it'll flag that as saying, well, this is a paper that supports that previous research. Or if I say that my results are inconsistent with FISB et al. 2016, it'll flag that as a contradicting source or a, a citation that um, is, you know, pointing out an inconsistency with that paper. And we also have an interface where you can go in, you can search for a given topic, and it'll show you, you know, here's the paper that you were looking at, and here's the different citations to that paper. And it'll show you what people are saying about it. And it's a really, I think, a really good way of getting a sense of not just what a particular paper is saying, but what other scientists and scholars are saying about that paper. You know, it's one thing to say, well, this paper has been cited 200 times. What if it's 10 times where people are saying, yeah, this is great, and 100 190 where people are saying we couldn't replicate these findings to save our life. That's the kind of thing we're trying to surface and expose. And if people want to play around with it, um, they can go to site.ai and there's my pitch and, uh, and have a look. We just started new visualizations so you can look at network maps of papers and how they cite each other. It's become a tool that I personally use in my research and my lit reviews and I encourage all my students to use it. It's been really part of my research workflow. If nothing else, I developed it so that I could use it, right? But I think that, you know, the as a, as a tool, hopefully it will go far in terms of combating a lot of the problems with science today in terms of the incentives being mismatched and scientists basically being incentivized to publish as much as possible and paying less attention to whether or not others can reproduce their work. Ultimately, you know, what we want to do is incentivize good science and more comprehensive literature reviews with our software. It's certainly, I think, both very interesting as a project, and um, if it succeeds, extraordinarily valuable, but also you're tackling two of the hardest problems that we know of, one being semantic analysis and understanding what people are saying with the written word, and also tackling an incentive problem that will be battling, if you succeed, 
people trying to game it in the same way that people try to gain uh, page rank. So uh, both valuable and, and I think highly challenging uh, thing you're doing. It, it is. We've discussed this internally a, a good bit about the idea of people sort of gaming the system in a sense. One of the things that we thought of is that like, okay, if I wanted to game this as sort of a metric and bump up my numbers, what would I do? Well, I might cite myself a lot and say really good things about myself. So that's another thing that I've been doing research with the organization is I've, I've been developing a system that will flag self citations. So you can look and say, well, yeah, this per this has a lot of highly supported citations, but they're mostly from the same person. So we're thinking about different ways to combat that kind of gaming of the system. It's definitely something that's on our mind. If I may leave off with a, a, a suggestion of sorts for that, Please. that the only real way to solve the gaming problem of everything from things like PageRank at, at Google to any, really any individual metric, I think is to have lots of metrics or to make the metric itself something that users can tweak so that there isn't necessarily, maybe there's a canonical score, a canonical scale or value that you create, but perhaps even more than that, people have certain dials that they can twist and then they get out a number and people will twist dials that penalize people for citing themselves or don't or whatever. This is, of course, computationally very challenging, but nonetheless, ideally, every person could tweak the, you know, the page rank algorithm, so to speak, according to what they want to get out of it. And any attempt to game the system in favor of one score or one type of score is going to penalize it uh, for someone else and their own ranking system. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. You know, we're still in the development phase, so maybe we'll see some of those features in the future. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. Sean, thanks for coming on The Filter. Thanks for having me, Matt. It was great. It was fun. Thanks for listening to The Filter with Matt Asher. You can find show notes at thefilter.org or follow user Matt Asher on the socials. 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 Socials.